My name's Jasper and welcome back to Buckle Up. Today I have a question. If you're looking for a seven seat family sized SUV, where should you actually be looking in today's car market? So should you be looking for something like a Land Rover or should you maybe be looking for something from Korea? I'm here today with the new Kia Sorento in an attempt to find that out. Let's start at the front of the Sorento where you'll see the design is purposeful but not obnoxiously so. You've got a really nicely integrated tiger nose grille that actually pulls round into the headlamp clusters and the daytime running lights sit underneath those. You've got various different layers as you drop down towards the floor. You'll also see Kia's new logo and this fantastic shape within the tiger nose grille. You do have some functional air vents at the side that direct airflow towards the wheel wells and you've got a nice hump in the centre of the bonnet. Continuing around the side of the car, you'll see the headlamp clusters actually curve round. You've got some gorgeous 19 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, which are a very nice design, but diamond cut wheels are a little bit more susceptible to curbing than their powder coated counterparts. There's an interesting bit of black plastic trim here, which is as far as I can tell for styling and that matches nicely with the gloss black mirror caps. There's some lovely bits of bright work all the way along the bottom of the car and matching on the door handles. However, the roof bars are actually gloss black plastic, so they're nice and subtle. The rear windows are tinted and there's a lovely bit of design as this curves and drops down towards the D pillar. However, that does mean that visibility from the third row of seats is slightly hampered. And at the rear of the vehicle, you see the continuation of a really premium design. These light clusters are excellent and vaguely Bentley-esque. You've got a concealed rear wiper, which is always a hallmark of quality. And it's a very understated, but yet well tied together design. You've obviously got your large Kia badge, your Sorento badge, and your HEV badge, which gives you a little bit of a clue as to the powertrain that this car has. And as you drop lower down, you'll see the off-roady style splitter, fake exhaust pipe surrounds, Matt Watson will be very disappointed, and a few reflectors. You've obviously got rear parking sensors and a rear camera. With the hybrid electric vehicle powertrain, the Sorento will only tow 1.65 tonnes, which is down on its diesel rivals, however, will still be enough for a caravan. The rear tailgate on the Sorento is electronic and can be opened in one of three ways. You have a button by your right knee as a driver, you also have a button on the key fob, or you have a button that you can get your hands dirty with every time you use it because it's not up here where it would make sense, it's down here. Now, once you open this, you will see a capacity of 608 litres with the rear seats in place. Now, this is a seven seater, so if you fold up your third row, that capacity will obviously shrink quite considerably. However, what I will add is that even with this third row in place, it is still quite an impressive amount of room that is left back here. Now, the Sorento was always designed as a three row SUV, and that means that Kia have integrated some really useful features back here for where that third row would be. They get their own air conditioning circuit, Temperature cannot be adjusted, but the fan speed can, and it can be individually turned on and off. So if you don't have passengers back here, you don't need to run that additional ring of cooling. Both of the seats back here have their own cup holder and cubby for possessions, and both seats have a USB-A port for charging electronic devices. There are tie-down hooks for a cargo net, as well as curry hooks on both sides of the boot so carrier bags can be secured in place. The rear seat belts are tucked behind excellent little hooks and the parcel shelf is actually pretty good at covering this entire space. Now, if you're one of those people who 
is quite lazy and can't be asked to open a door and fold a seat down, you'll be incredibly pleased to know that you have buttons on this side which allow you to fold the second row completely flat. And if you do so, you get 1,996 litres of luggage space back here, which is excellent. The seats are nearly completely flat, so it's an excellent load bay to push things all the way back to. You do have a very small amount of underboot storage here. You've got a cubby at both edges. However, here is your um, jack and small toolkit, and under here is the 12 volt battery for the vehicle electrics. Now, you do have a space saver spare wheel on the Sorento. However, it is accessed from the outside of the car. So let's hope nobody finds that out and wants to nick it. It's under here. Shall we have a look inside? Climbing into the third row of the Sorento is actually a very simple thing to do because with a single button press, the second row seat both folds forwards and moves out of your way, leaving actually a reasonable opening to clamber through. Now, doing so is pretty easy, and um, once you're back here, there's actually a reasonable amount of space, with the small exception of headroom. So if I put this seat back into a second row position and get myself comfortable, my head is actually touching the roof of the car, which is a rarity for somebody of my stature in a vehicle like this. However, it is something to make note of. So these seats are probably best suited to children for long journeys. In a pinch, you could absolutely carry seven adults in this car if you needed to. There's plenty of room back here in this third row. I've got plenty of elbow room and the only department I'm lacking in slightly is the headroom one. Now the floor is quite high which is always going to be an issue with cars that are seven seaters um, because this third row has to form the boot floor and that means you don't necessarily get as much under thigh support as would be ideal. Let's clamber one row further forwards and see if the second row is even better than it is back here. The second row is excellent. There is a lot of leg room back here, and that includes the fact that you can move the seats forwards. Um, so even if you have people in that third row, there is still more than enough leg room to keep passengers in this row comfortable. The array of features you have is also excellent. So the seats have got plenty of, of adjustability, both in terms of forwards and backwards, but also in terms of reclining. So if you're on a long journey and want to fall asleep, you could absolutely do so in the second row of the Sorento. I have got two stage heated seats on the outer seats of this row, as well as a fantastic cup holder mounted in the door card. So I can put my bottle of water both here and lower down there. Additionally, there are two cup holders in the center armrest. So again, six places to put a drink here if you really want to. There is a 12 volt charge port down here, which will put out 180 watts of power, and you've got three USB type A ports, one in the center console here, and one in the back of both the driver and passenger seats. It really is well equipped and well designed. These seats are a lovely fake leather material with some flat areas and some perforated sections, and even some nice little bits of pattern towards the edges of the seats. Plenty of adjustability, plenty of comfort, and yeah, somewhere you could absolutely just spend a lot of time. When you look to the side, if you have a baby back here that you want to shield from the sun, you don't even need to stick an aftermarket sun visor on because the Sorento has them built into the windows in the second row. Really nice thought there. One other thing you can do um, as a rear seat passenger is if the front seat passenger is annoying you slightly, you do, all, you do have buttons on the side of this seat to actually just move it a little bit further and crush them against the dashboard if you really want to. Oh, also the floor is basically completely flat, which makes it really easy to put larger things back here for storage, or it just means that if you've got three people sitting back here, that middle passenger isn't going to feel too uncomfortable. 
You have Isofix mounting points, interestingly, on both of these outer seats as well as the two seats in the third row. So you could put four child seats in this car if you really want to. The front passenger seat does not have Isofix mounting points. How will people manage? The front of the Sorento is a similar story to the back in the sense that you've got some really good materials in here as well as an excellent layout and design. The whole integration of the infotainment system into the dashboard is wonderful. You've got a really sensible and usable climate control section here, not in the screen, physical buttons, woo! Ah, well, a mixture of physical and capacitive buttons actually. Um, and then you've got some really, really useful cubby spacers too. I've got space for a bottle in both of the door cards. I've got two cup holders here, a large covered bin, which has a Qi wireless charger within it, as well as two charging USB ports and the USB port for connecting your phone to the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto integration in the infotainment system. There's also space for some other little bits down here, maybe your keys, for example. There's a, a kind of finger deep storage cubby here as well as a slot below the opening for the center armrest which is fantastically deep and has an additional removable tray in it so a really good array of storage cubbies in here as well as a glove box which is a very good size your heated and ventilated seat controls are here on the center console you've got your rotary gear selector and a rotary mode uh, selector for both the drivetrain as well as your off-road functions because the Sorento is an all-wheel drive model. So I've got the option to choose between snow, mud and sand or have all of those off and then drive modes I've got Eco Sport and Smart. On the whole the, the only thing I can say about this interior is how well designed it is, how well laid out it is and how practical it is. It's such a selling point of this car to me. Um, it's brilliant. I love spending time in here. Everything's exactly where it should be and it's all really easy to use as well. So what is the Sorento like to drive? And I'll be putting these on because it's a little bit sunny now. The overwhelming um, thing that I will be talking about here is how well this handles. Now, the Sorento is a shade under two tonnes curb weight. Um, so with, you, with a driver, you're looking at somewhere just over the two tonne mark. Um, and it handles so much better than it weight suggests it should. Um, this is really a car that has surprised me in terms of its grip and turn-in throughout the entire time I have had it. And that's because it is somewhat stiffly sprung. Now, the stiffness in the suspension does mean that when you go over an undulating road surface over or over imperfections, you can feel them a little bit. Now, I described the ride as ever so slightly jiggly but it is by no means uncomfortable. It's an incredibly well handling and road holding chassis this. It really does feel excellent. Now, the seats don't offer a massive amount of support, but then again, it's not a sports car. It's not designed to be thrown into corners, but it is absolutely something that you could have a bit of fun in. Now, the powertrain is a 1.6 litre turbocharged four cylinder petrol engine paired with a battery pack and a, an electric motor. And the combined power output of this setup is 226 brake horsepower and 350 newton meters of torque, which are both respectable figures. If you want a little bit more power and want a Sorento, I'd urge you to look at the plug-in hybrid version, which comes with a few more. This is the HEV powertrain, which is a hybrid electric vehicle or a self-charging hybrid. So a conventional hybrid. You've got a small battery pack and a small electric motor, and it will recoup energy as you brake or coast or go down hills and that will be used the electric motor will be used to fill in gaps in the drive experience where the conventional turbocharged petrol and automatic gearbox uh, are slightly limited in terms of their power output 
Now what this means is the car will actually set off in an electric only mode and it's only when you start kind of pressing on a little bit that the actual engine kicks in. So this is a car that, you know, for short journeys with uh, low speed, you could potentially not even have the engine come on at all for if the battery is sufficiently charged. Now, that's not to say it will drive itself on electric power only because it's a conventional hybrid setup. So the primary mover is indeed the engine, but the motor is powerful enough and the battery is large enough that just for that little first instance of a journey, you will be gliding along silently on the inside. The exterior of the car does play a noise to alert pedestrians that there is a moving vehicle nearby. Even now, I am just gliding along at 55 miles an hour and the engine has cut out and I'm running in EV mode only. So in eco mode for the drivetrain, the engine is very eager to drop in and out depending on the throttle input so you can save that bit of extra fuel. Now you do have two other drive modes. So by default, the car will start in eco. If I twiddle this dial down here, it will drop into sport mode where the engine is more eager to be contributing and certainly your throttle response feels a lot sharper and the steering weights up a bit as well. There is also a third mode which is called smart and what that will do is it will kind of change the way the car responds based on your throttle input so it will you know if you're driving quite economically and just coasting and not using much throttle input it will tailor the driving experience more towards an economical drive whereas if you start pressing on it will start giving you a bit more power from the uh, engine through more quickly and the result will feel like a bit more of a sprightly drive. Now in eco mode, this car is nippy from set off, but not especially fast. And that's still the case in sport mode, but in sport, it feels a lot more eager to start pressing on. So 0 to 60 is dispatched in nine seconds, which is not actually that fast. However, the electric motor gives you a sense of urgency at initial set off, which means that certainly for urban driving, this does actually feel pretty, pretty quick. Um, now it's a long car at 4,810 millimeters, which is a little bit shorter than cars like the Sanyong Rexton and um, Land Rover Discovery. However, it's by no means a small vehicle. Um, obviously it's a seven seater, so it's going to feel quite large, but your view forwards is pretty good and you can kind of guess where the extremities of the car is. Even though the bonnet drops away a little bit, you can still get a feel for where that front bumper sits. Um, certainly the back is quite vertical, so that is a good thing. And your view all round, side mirrors are excellent and the view through the rear view mirror is okay. I mean, obviously if you've got a lot of passengers back there, that will become a little bit worse. However, as it is currently, um, with nobody back there, it's pretty good actually. Now, when you start pressing on in this car, it does actually feel pretty good. Um, the chassis is excellent. It's the thing that surprised me the most about this whole driving experience, to be honest, because it handles itself incredibly well. Now, yes, the suspension is a little bit firm, but I'd much rather have slightly firmer suspension um, which means that I don't wallow round every corner. This composes itself incredibly well as you take twisty roads on. And the powertrain is more than capable of doing a motorway cruise as well. So this will average somewhere in the region of 40 miles per gallon in mixed driving. And that's not bad at all for a seven seater with a 1.6 turbo petrol engine. This has the propensity to be an incredibly thirsty car, but it isn't. That hybrid powertrain really does assist with that. At this point, it's also worth noting the full array of driver assist systems you get, such as lane keep assist, adaptive cruise control and blind spot monitoring, as well as a heads up display, which allows you to see the current speed limit and the activation of all of those systems. The only thing that I'd say ever so slightly lets the driving experience down, and it's by no means a deal breaker at all, is the six speed automatic gearbox. 
and that's just because it's not quite as good as some of the best gearboxes on the market. It's only a six speed box with five being your direct drive one to one ratio and six being your only overdrive gear. And the only thing I'd say is that certainly in eco mode and in smart mode, it feels a little bit dim witted. It's not particularly slow and it's not not smooth. There are just better gearboxes available on the market, which are a little bit snappier to change and a little bit smoother to change. So you can kind of really notice this as it drops a gear on when you're on the motorway, for example. There is a moment as the power dips out and it shuffles a gear around and then brings it back in. So there are gearboxes that are better able to put the power down, but it's by no means a deal breaker for this car. Under normal driving circumstances, it is a really good, well-refined driving exercise experience and very capable as well. So all in all, I guess I'd say, yeah, really good drive. Um, maybe minorly improved by some gearbox work, but honestly, it's fantastic. Also, when you're parking, you have the full array of 360 degree cameras, which just means that it's incredibly easy to gauge the size of what is quite a large car and fit yourself into some tight parking spaces. And obviously at the start of the video, we kind of showed off the thing where you can park it from the key. So you can get out and just use the key to back it into a tight parking space if you need to. I also love the little animations and chimes it plays as you, at you as you get out of the car. Ding, ding, ding. Really luxurious. So, the Kia Sorento. Should you get one of these if you are in the market for a seven-seat SUV? I would say yes, actually. I think the interior is better thought out even than direct competitors such as the Hyundai Santa Fe. It's certainly got a better quality and better laid out interior than cars such as the Sanyong Rexton, and it's a damn sight cheaper than a Land Rover Discovery. So yes, all round good buy. Good engine, great driving characteristics, really, really practical and full of features that would make a family with several children happy. So absolutely a strong recommendation from me. If you've enjoyed today's video, please remember to let us know by liking, subscribing, and most importantly, dinging that bell so you get notifications, and maybe even leaving a comment down below to tell us what you think. Check out all of our social medias, which are linked in the description, as well as a few ways you can directly support the channel, be that here on YouTube, on Patreon, or by buying some lovely, lovely merch. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video, and hopefully it's a little bit less sunny then. Bye.